Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's Friday uh, the 27th. We're almost out of January, wow. which is, is good. Uh, well, it's never good to lose days, is it? Uh, but uh, it's moving along, uh, and uh, it's great to see the sun shining, and we've got some good uh, people to hear from this morning. and. Uh, so welcome, and we'll introduce ourselves. We've got three new uh, members, uh, Gus, and, and uh, then you introduce yourself and your crew, and we'll get started. Morning, Brian Collimore, representing the Rutland District. Irene Renner, Chittenden North, including Fairfax. Brian Campion, Bennington County. Rich Westman Memorial, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, <laughs> Senator. And Bobby Starr, uh, representing the Irving's uh, County uh, District. So, welcome, Gus. Thank you. For the record, I'm Gus Seelig. I'm the director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and I want to introduce uh, a few folks who are here with me. Polly Major is our policy director. Some of you may have come across her when she was working for the last four years with Senator Leahy, uh, but she joined us this fall, and we're delighted to have her. Also with me is Stacy Sumulia, who is the director of our Ag program, and Liz Gleason, who some of you have met before, who is the director of the Farm and Forest Viability Program, which also oversees the Rural Economic Development Initiative. And um, I'm not sure we'll get into as much depth as you're going to want to on some subjects today, but I thought the assignment was particularly for new members to give the broad overview of the organization yep. and our general role. Um, Although I've known Senator Campion for a few years, I think it's the first time I've ever had a chance to be in a committee room with you. Uh, we've maybe finance, you. maybe finance. Uh, rarely in yeah, finance, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. But we did come across each other at a great event uh, over in Shaftesbury when we opened some houses right. two years ago. Right. So with that, um, yeah, Holly, yeah. you can help me screen share, because this is not my skill. Also not your computer. <laughs> and not my computer. <laughs> Um, let's move on to the first slide. Mm. Okay. Senator Campion's also the chair of education on the Senate side, so we we did we worked the two committees quite a lot together on the Universal uh, School Meals program. And, he liked that. He enjoyed the ag committee so much that he. Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of the chairs. He uh, <laughs> wanted uh, to join up with us, yeah. so uh, it's uh, pretty nice to have uh, him as a uh, yeah. member. Yeah, and um, I'll say that I have to, I, I've been invited to be with two of you in the institutions committee this afternoon, so. Um, some of this may get repetitive, and um, but you're going to enjoy hearing from Stacy and Liz this morning and not this afternoon. So I hope it won't be super repetitive. But um, let me start with the mission statement. And I need to acknowledge that this mission statement was put together uh, when Senator Starr was Representative Starr and Chair of the House Ag Committee. And Senator Westman was also in the other body and was one of the original sponsors. Uh, the lead back then on this program was Representative Jean Ann Duffy from Milton. Um, and it was a broad coalition. I think there were something like 28 House members, uh, maybe it was 18 House members and nine senators because the legislation was introduced in both bodies that supported it. Uh, but fundamentally, we are asked uh, to focus on the dual goals of protecting Vermont's agricultural land, forest land, while also providing uh, affordable housing because it's of primary importance not just by themselves, but to economic vitality and quality of life. And when you, when you go through our presentation, um, we'll talk a fair amount about how we see our conservation mission as being essential to uh, the economy of the state. And there are some things we define as part of our conservation work, like the Farm and Forest Viability Program and the Ready Program that I think people, Neil Wonderville told me we ought to rebrand because we're doing a fair amount of economic development for rural communities. Vermont's also had a long-term um, land use policy that goes back to something from the 1930s called the Countryside Commission, hmm. which 
basically said our land use policy really needs to reflect compact settlement but surrounded by a working landscape. Um, and some of you will recall that some years back the Council on Rural Development did a public opinion survey in Vermont and asked Vermonters what their values were. And 97% said the working landscape, that that's whether you grew up here or you came here, that that landscape, whether you're getting food from it or recreation or you view it as important for climate mitigation is why so many of us love to be here. And um, uh, uh, and so the, the area you're looking at here is the North Bennington Shaftesbury line. And, um, and I'm not gonna show the pictures today, but I often show three pictures of how um, that community has used our support over three decades. It's a small rural town uh, in southern Vermont. And, and the very first thing that happened was back in the early 90s, uh, Stanley Tools left Shaftesbury, big, big employer. And the community group came forth and said, we want you to help us buy a house. And the house they wanted us to help them buy was owned at one time by the poet Robert Frost, and they've turned it into a museum, and they wanted there to be a reason for people to come to Shaftesbury. A decade after that, um, you see the body of water there is Lake Perrin, and a group of locals had bought a bunch of land around uh, the pond, and they didn't want to develop camps all over it. They wanted to turn it into the Lake Perrin recreation area, and in two different conservation deals, they said, we said, okay, we're going to help you, and there is a beautiful recreation area there. And this is about, I would say, a seven-minute, eight-minute walk from uh, the village of North Bennington. They also held out five acres um, because they knew that the community was going to need housing, and it took another 12 years, but Shaftesbury changed its zoning to allow 25 homes on that five acres of an apartment complex. The village of North Bennington extended its sewer, its water line to them, and the town of Bennington its sewer line, in order to have that compact development. And so, people of modest means can live in that community. They are just a few minute walk from the Lake Perrin Recreation Area, and a short walk into North Bennington to the library to the elementary school. So that just is a an example. We can't be in Shaftesbury every year, but um, periodically we get to small towns as well as large ones. Um, uh, this is our, um, just a few things in the Northeast Kingdom about our work, and you're looking at uh, Lake Men for Magog, and on the left um, is the old convent and Sacred Heart High School, and after years of trying, the nuns have made a deal with a group called Rural Edge, <laughs> and we'll build 26 apartments in and around the convent this year, and there's room for hundreds more units on the site, uh, and Newport would like some home ownership as long, along with rental housing. So I think over the next decade, there'll probably be three or four projects there. Great, and at least at this point, from up there, you can see down at the lake. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful place. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Gorgeous. And yeah. if, you, if you've never been up there, you can see the church yeah. uh, in the big picture. Yeah. Well, the building on the left is the school maybe yeah and it's to the left of the church as we're looking at that picture maybe a, a minute long I mean it's right in the same basically parking lot and a lot of room uh, it's a pretty big plot of land that's going to go with with the school yeah. and the yeah. sisters uh, where they lived yeah. so yeah. it's really a great project for, yeah. for that spot and it sat idle for it's been more than 10 long, years yeah long long time and that that's a hallmark of our housing work is to take white elephant properties and turn them into um, usable assets for the community and uh, you know we were at an old school in Senator Collinworth's district that's gotten turned into housing mm -hmm. um, about a year or so ago yeah. um, uh, and on the right, what you see is a trail, and that trail is on the Bluffside Farm, which the Vermont Land Trust bought from the Scott family um, uh, a few years ago, and they thought they'd just would flip it to a young farmer. But the more they talked to the community, the more they realized it was a great place for education because it's not far from North Country High School. 
um, and they've had students working there. And then they also recognized that there was a, a recreation need. And Newport has really struggled since the, before the EB-5 scandal, but since then. And, and what we ended up helping them do, and we'll talk about this more in Senate institutions today, uh, is we helped them through our READY program and through a special um, appropriation that uh, former Senator Flory had arranged to build a bridge that connects this farm to Prouty Beach and downtown. And so, and then at the other end of the farm is the BB Rail Trail, which goes to the Canadian border and beyond. So while some people would think about this as a recreation project, for Newport, it's gonna be a way for cyclists to really enjoy the countryside and hopefully for Canadians, uh, now that the border's reopened, to be bicycling back and forth across the border and into downtown Newport. Yeah, the trail across the border goes all the way up through to Montreal. Well, I think it goes up towards Sherbrooke, oh. and then it does cut off and go the other way as well as uh, to uh, to the uh, eastern part of Quebec. What are those little? I don't know if they're ridges or well, it was a it was a railroad uh, oh, track. Okay. So those are ties, maybe. Yeah. That's an early picture. It's a beautiful trail now. Uh, yeah. And I was, yeah, that the bridge stairs. The bridge is gorgeous. So that I have a picture um, when uh, before it opened to the public. With uh, I was visiting with Senator Starr and Representative Marcotte, and it was one of those hot days in July where you just soak your shirt through just standing still. And we're, we're looking pretty pretty tired <laughs> yeah, that afternoon. Um, housing programs. Um, there's, for those of you who are uh, new to us, um, there's no kind of housing that we don't do. Uh, so we've worked with manufactured home communities. We are working on home ownership. We are, our primary work is in rental housing. Um, since the pandemic, uh, there's been a focus on helping people to move from uh, who are unhoused in permanent housing, and we played a major role in that um, throughout the state. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about that uh, with any of you and your constituents on a different day. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and the governor's talked about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And one of the ways we have tried to work on that these last couple years um, has been to establish a program to improve the quality of farm worker housing around the state. Uh, we're working with the Champlain Housing Trust that has a partnership with UVM Extension, um, and they've approved uh, funding for 21 farm worker housing rehab projects uh, that will house 100 folks, and there's more on the way. Uh, I do have to say, and we'll talk more at the end of this, our budget may not, the budget proposed by the governor may not allow us to continue that program next year um, uh, at its current level, uh, but we would very much like to. We think it's really important. Do, um, we, do we get a chance to adjust that? I believe we do. Yeah. Near the end of the session. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, We've worked on all kinds of conservation. I know we are the clean water service provider for the Lake Memphis Magog area. On um, that was something ANR came and asked us to do when MBPA declined to do it. Uh, we're in, involved in recreational lands um, across the state. Um, uh, in Senator Collimore's district, we were um, we had a great celebration. Uh, of the Jim Jefford State Forest a few years ago. I know that uh, I was showing a picture of Bird Mountain one year in the other body, and Representative Helms said, oh, I shot a deer there once, so I <laughs> felt good about that. Um, uh, and we have other programs, you know, we've worked with, again, in terms of economic development, we've worked with Kingdom Trails on their first several acquisitions. Most of their land has been uh, by permission and um, that's a great thing that landowners are willing to let them use it, but they've become so popular that I think they felt they yeah, need to own some really, of the land themselves because sometimes it gets to be too much for private land. Yeah. That's really big up in uh, St. J. Lindenburg. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they attract thousands of bikers up there. Um, big picture, and you'll get our annual report next week. Um, this is what we've done over the last 18 months with the funds that have been provided to us and the leverage achieved. 
Um, and were this pre-pandemic, the homes and apartments number would have been in the 300 unit range. So uh, a lot more activity than usual. Um, we're gonna talk today about our development rights program, our farm and forest viability program, and the Rural Economic Development Initiative uh, to some degree, but we describe our program impacts more and more as being rural community development um, uh, and downtown revitalization. And, uh, and a big part of our work is uh, helping uh, young farmers get on their first farm. The picture, by the way, just in terms of serving rural communities uh, is the town of Westford, and we help them get a town forest that's adjacent to their elementary school. And for Westford, I think that's quite a turnout. So the community was clearly excited about, about that. You had a good turnout. I, I do want to say, um, and this goes back to the, to the beginnings of the program and, and to the overall mission. Um, Senator Westman and I were part of a delegation um, with the House Ag Committee in 1988 when the program was just a year old. And we, the American Farmland Trust took us to Massachusetts yeah. and Connecticut that had more mature development rights programs at that time. And it was a really instructive um, uh, trip for me as somebody who didn't come with an ag background, uh, both because I got to spend a day and a half with people. And back then, uh, the house had lots of farmers in the house, and I could hear their stories and hear about their lives and their struggles. <laughs> Um, but as we traveled, um, there were several lessons that the Massachusetts and Connecticut folks um, talked to us about. One was, don't try to save a farm in every town. Support farm communities. And, because when you do that, you're going to support the infrastructure that supports those families as well. And I remember our very last farm in Connecticut, and it was basically surrounded by suburbia and lots of traffic. and um, and that message from that farmer was just really loud and clear about, you know, when you have lots of neighbors, um, what they want from agriculture is different than uh, when you have a farm community of neighbors um, and how hard it was <coughs> machinery on the roads and people buzzing by fast and, and dealing with odors and all that. So a big part of our work has been uh, really to invest in our strongest farming communities. And there are now large plots of conserved farmland. Um, we'll talk in a few minutes about the viability program. Um, and we are actively and have been for 20 years working on helping people for whom dairy is not um, the way they're gonna make their living in the future. Um, but we are also seeing lots of large farm operators buy conserved parcels. and and it is of great economic value to them to not be paying full development value for land. Um, so uh, I'm gonna leave this seat in the, at, with this slide. Yeah. Right. I just say, since you brought it up, what I've seen in my area is um, conserved land, particularly conserved land in floodplain, that now is um, there's a 35 acre piece behind me that went up for sale well or the large firm paid five thousand dollars an acre and it's very hard for anybody new to break into farming with that kind of price with the price of equipment and I think from my vantage point um, the question comes up what do we want of agriculture and how are you thinking about the future going forward around that because agriculture is becoming cornered by those very large producers and that's it and I'm not sure that that's what we want the next generation. Um, I think you're asking exactly the right question and we have been struggling with this over many years so the first 15 years of the program um, you know what we did with our ag easements was to have a right of first refusal and then we introduced um, uh, beginning around 2000 or 2002 this option to purchase at ag value but as we talked to the farm community back then what they said to us was 
um, we don't want you to interfere in sales between farmers. So the, the, while we have this option and we've never had to exercise it, um, I think that the, the issue of how do we get the next generation into agriculture has become a harder problem to solve because we've seen big farms outcompete young entrepreneurs for land and they need the land, it, it's staying in agriculture, but it isn't the kind of agriculture that we had 40 years ago where you know you could have a small operation. I mean, when we began this work, 100 cows was a pretty large farm. There weren't 1,200 cow farms back then. So um, the Farm Land Trust and we have focused a lot on how do we help the next generation get onto farm onto farmland. We introduced paying what we call an option to purchase at ag value. Um, I think one of the lessons we've learned over the years is that it's good to conserve, even though we might have a 600 acre parcel, we might want to uh, conserve it in smaller chunks. And I think we're going to need some additional tools that help the young farmers get onto, farm, onto farms. Um, there's a provision in the federal farm bill for the matching funds we use, and every dollar we spend on development rights is matched by a federal dollar called buy, protect, sell, that would allow a group like the Vermont Land Trust to buy the farm, hold it, and then resell it. And I think we're gonna need, going forward, more provisions and stronger provisions around affordability. Um, we use a model in our housing work that uh, where people share appreciation uh, with a nonprofit, so they don't fully benefit at full market value when it's time to sell. And I think we're getting, how we do that, and we want to do it with sensitivity to the concerns of farmers, I, I can't tell you we've yet figured out exactly how we ought to do it, but we've been involved in lots of farm transfer work to young farmers over the last um, few years. Um, I don't know if any of you have been at the market at the corner of Route 2 and Route 100 and B in Middlesex, but the story there is a young couple and, and um, Liz can tell the story better than I, so I should say probably a little bit, not a lot. Uh, but we helped them buy their first farm, we helped them buy their second farm, we gave them a business plan to open them, that market, and it's a terrific market, but they're doing great work. Um, so we have to focus more of our efforts on how do we get the next generation into agriculture at a price point that they can afford. Yeah. And development rights is one tool, it won't be the only tool. Yeah, it's um, been a pretty good yeah. ride, though. I mean, we've yeah, yeah. conserved a lot of good agricultural land, and <clears throat> now we got to keep farmers on that land farming of yeah. what, whatever type to yeah. mm -hmm. keep it open mm -hmm. and productive. For me, the crisis is in small farms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it hasn't, it kind of hasn't hit the big farms as hard as the little ones, but you take a, say if we, when it does get there, because it, it'll get there. Um, you know, you start taking a 12 to 2,000 cow herd farm with three to 5,000 acres and it, it's gonna go bust. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking some s s serious, serious money. Mm -hmm. Even with the development rights gone, to yeah. keep that farm so somebody can go in there and buy it. Yep. At, uh, so it, if, if we can, we should keep what we got there. And uh, I think, uh, thank you, Gus. Uh, any other questions right now for no. Gus? Okay, no. Stacy. Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Great to see everyone. So Gus did a great job of queuing me up to talk with you about our agriculture program. So my name is Stacy Sabula and I'm the agriculture director at the HCB. I've been in that post for about two years. So I have to say this is the first time I've been in the state house because <laughs> I was a pandemic Hello. hire. So it's a good initiation. Welcome, welcome. welcome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm just going to start off with kind of a 
uh, broad brush overview of our program and then go into some more details about some recent projects that we've funded. So um, since we were established back in 1987, we've helped conserve almost 800 farms across the state, which is around 171,000 acres. So um, definitely something um, we're proud of and our partners are proud of, but definitely more work ahead of us. Um, in the last year and a half, we've helped conserve 24 farms across the state, which is around 4,200 acres. And we really can't do this work without our partnerships. So we work, probably not surprisingly to you, really closely with Vermont Land Trust as the biggest land trust in the state. And they have a wonderful ag program and have spent um, a lot of years building that program and adapting it to some of the challenges that we talked about earlier around trying to target um, smaller farms and helping the next generation get on land. So we're really proud to be working with them. And then also um, our federal partner, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So as Gus mentioned, they are typically providing match. 50% um, uh, of our typical project is being funded with federal dollars, um, which is just phenomenal. Without that program, we, we wouldn't be able to do this work. So very grateful for that and for the great team at the state and our CS office. So at this point in Vermont, we have protected about 20% of our ag land, and a lot of that has really been the cream of the crop, the best, you know, the prime and statewide, statewide important agricultural soils. Um, we still definitely have more, more work to do. Um, a couple of things I want to mention I'll talk more about in uh, my next slides, but probably not surprising to you, also a big part of our work throughout our conservation work, but also with our um, ag projects is focusing on um, water resource protection. So, you know, with all of the talk about um, concern about both Lake Champlain and then for Magog and, and pollution and, and concern about ag's role in that. Um, this is something that we also take really seriously with our projects and as do our partners. So with every farm project that has any kind of water resources on it, we're making sure that the, the streams have vegetated buffers. If there are wetland areas, those are set aside and that agricultural activities can't happen there. Um, and then another piece of that is also um, at times restoration projects. So often our land trust partners are talking to landowners and connecting them with like federal and state partners who or funders who might be able to help them um, um, do restoration work like tree plantings and things like that. So it's all it's all holistic. It all it all connects together. And then as Gus has already talked about and we'll talk about more as and Liz will as well is that conservation is really a great tool for getting land in the hands of the next generation and keeping these, these farms active and viable. Can I ask, sure. uh, the 20%, does that include forested land too? My understanding, yeah. I think it's, it's taking into account um, the whole farm. So obviously with most farms, there's a sugar bush or other piece of forest land. Yeah, that's a good question. All right. And I'm, I'm a little worried about time, so I may, I may not get through all of mine. I don't want to short change Liz, so we'll just keep an eye on it. And please do ask questions as I go. Yeah. Um, so just wanted to highlight a couple of, of recent projects that we funded. So um, in the upper left corner, Wildstone Farm in Palmo. Um, this is a small farm, a great example of a really successful, productive small farm. Um, they are an organic veggie operation and one of the oldest, or, or actually the oldest certified organic farm down in Bunnington, um, have known, known in the community as, as being great mentors to young farmers coming in. And um, this was a, a relatively small, small grant for us and I think also is, is nice to see that we, we fund both smaller farms like this as well as the big, the big operations. Um, and the next farm I'll talk about is Bissette. Um, oops, um, Ted Bissette is there in the shot with the ice dog near tractor. Um, this one is hot off the press. Our, our board just funded it yesterday. Um, it was awarded $733,500 for this 200 acre farm that's in Fairfax. It was a conventional dairy up until about 15 years ago. And um, Ted and his, his wife, Chris, ended up selling their herd as it just became um, too difficult to financially for them to keep going. But um, at this point, I mean, they're very excited, and this is a, a common theme too, to be able to use the funding from the development rights to 
breathe new life into the farm. So they have um, a growing sugaring operation, they've got um, some beef cattle, they have ideas for some other diversified enterprises they're hoping to bring onto the farm. And so um, they actually, another cool part of this project is they were really excited to learn about our farm and forest viability program and have already called up um, Liz's team to ask about getting business um, planning help. So that's a common thing we see where folks learn about our other programs through, through conservation, which is great. Um, and then um, folks on the right, Boneyard Farm, they are Hannah and John Doyle, and that's one of their little boys. Um, they are based up in Fletcher, and um, this is a, another transfer situation where it was a, a dairy farm owned by the King family for a long time, and there was a death in the family, and um, they decided at that point that they needed to sell, and ended up transferring the land to, to this young couple who's doing a, a diversified operation. They were, at the time, on just 10 acres of land, more of like a homesteading operation and running the space and, and needed, needed um, a good tract of land. And so Vermont Land Trust connected them with the King family and now they're running a, a pasture-raised pork and chicken operation there. It seems like we've had <clears throat> Mrs. Uh, Doyle. Yep. We have yeah. her in to testify. Oh, great. Um, her, is it her husband does some carpentry work? Yeah, yeah. I think he does fencing as well, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Fen yeah. something else. And But she was really tuned in uh, to what they were doing on the farm. Did a bang up job. That's great. Yeah. Great to hear. We like when, when farmers are advocating for these programs, too. Um, great, and so um, a few more slides to share. So the Gray Dairy Farm is a, an example of a large conventional operation, I believe one of the largest dairy farms in the state up in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so they, uh, at this point, are milking about 4,500 cows, own quite a bit of land in the area. And this was an example, um, the, the farm is there on the right that they recently purchased. So. Um, that farm was owned by some out-of-state landowners who weren't really using it to its full potential. And um, it came on the market and the Grace jumped on it, um, knowing that it would be great for them to be able to have such a nice large tract of land and not be, have to rely as much on lease holdings, which is really common too. And so um, you know, the sale of development rights helped them be able to afford that purchase. Uh, the other thing that's really neat about this project, and I think is indicative of a lot of our ad projects, is that there are strong community benefits to, to this land. So this property historically has been used by local folks for recreation, hunting, um, hiking, cross-country skiing, and so um, as part of this easement, there is um, public access for recreational purposes, and the, the Grays are happy to continue that and have commit, then maintaining those trails. Is that located near the home farm, or? It's a couple yeah. miles to like the southeast of there, I believe. I haven't been on their home farm, so I can't say with certainty, but it's yeah. it's not far. But they they go way up into Essex County, through through the woods. They have their own farm road up through, and and uh, so it's a good big operation. Yeah, definitely. Um, and in the family, oh, it's the generations, the great family. Yeah. Um, and then, let's see, last but not least, uh, the Sats family. And this might be a familiar farm to some of you. Um, it's actually called the Woods Market Garden. And so this farm was owned at one point by Representative Bob Wood. Oh. Yeah. Just uh, south of Brandon. Yeah. yeah. So he um, sold the land to John Satz in, I believe, um, the year 2000, so quite a while ago. And evidently, um, Representative Wood was not um, a huge proponent of conservation and, and didn't want to go through that process himself. But, um, my alarm's going off. Um, but he ended up selling the farm to John, this young farmer, John Satz, who did want to go through conservation and knew that that would help keep the farm more affordable for him, and um, did that with Vermont Land Trust, that initial project we were involved in. 
But then uh, fast forward to now, um, John Satz um, had acquired some additional land ne um, next to the original farm and wanted to conserve this new tract of land. So approached VLT about going through that process. And um, actually in, in this situation is, 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 has a sad story. Um, the reason that the Satz family in part wanted to, to go through conservation a second time was to set the farm up to be transferred to someone new. So, so um, John uh, was very ill and ended up passing away and so his wife Courtney wasn't able to keep the farm going. And so being able to um, protect more of the land and also add um, this farm did not initially have the op option to purchase the agricultural value that Gus was talking about and so we were able to purchase one of those retroactively, which then brought the purchase price down for the next farmers to come in. So definitely a sad story, but um, yeah, I think that the that Courtney Satz is, feels good knowing the land's gonna remain in farming and they've got a young couple coming in who will run a very similar um, uh, farm operation. This farm stand, if you know it, it's right over at seven, a million cars go by there a day and it's very popular, so no doubt that they'll They'll have good success with that. I'm just going to interrupt for a second because sure. some of you do represent Wood yeah. quite well. And um, though philosophically he was not a big fan of government buying development rights, after the farm was sold, I was talking to him one day and I said, How are they doing? And his reply was, I just wish they'd asked me to help them more. <laughs> uh, so he was quite delighted that the farm. Yeah. And state in production. And, uh, uh, yeah. He was always uh, had a good heart. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that anecdote. Um, okay, so um, last but not least, wanted to just again highlight water quality and how important this is in our agricultural work. So um, here is our um, the language that was added to the VHCB enabling. Um, legislation back in let's see 2012 with this purpose related to water quality which really gave us um, even more more impetus to go out and be able to fund projects that high, highlight and emphasize water resource protection um, and so as I already mentioned we are always looking at farms from the perspective of there are waterways we got to have them buffered if they're wetland areas are going to be set aside and have special protections in the easement and whenever possible, being able to work with our partners to do restoration work. So I see this as, it's a really great opportunity, especially when you talk about transferring land from one generation to the next with the easement, this kind of, these kind of water quality protections would not happen any other way. So it's, it's a really good um, tool to be able to facilitate that. Um, and then the other thing that we're able to do is connect folks with our water quality grants program through our viability work. So Liz will probably talk more about that, but we have a, um, a grants program for landowners who are implementing different water quality, like infrastructure improvements, like someone who has a, um, some newer storage problems and needs infrastructure upgrades, we can help fund that and it typically gets matched with state and federal funds. So I'm happy to, I know I zipped right through that, happy to answer Questions from folks? Um, sure. You did too good a job. <laughs> no Jeez, questions. Me, me <laughs> yeah, well, th thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, uh, Liz, sorry, so just one other thing. Just from a financial perspective, development rights generally are not less than 30 or 40 percent of the value of a farm these days, and often. Yeah well over 60%. So from a financial perspective, which is where a farmer needs to start, is does this make financial sense? It's a it's a big help in lowering the, the capital yes. cost. We're freeing up capital that people yeah. use to invest in water quality, to invest in expansion, to invest in switching businesses. And to, the last program that's 50% um, matched with the or, yes. so you know we're getting a dollar for a dollar to help and it's a good thing we got that land conserved because we saw what happened during the pandemic mm -hmm. with people coming up here buying 
everything and anything sight unseen. Uh, so, no, I guess we'll continue to grow something in Vermont uh, and uh, besides houses. Um, so thank you, uh, yeah. very good. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Thanks everyone for having me. I'm Liz Gleason. I'm the program director for the Farm and Forest Viability Program here at VHCB, which also includes our Rural Economic Development Initiative, which Gus mentioned and I'll touch briefly on later, but mostly going to focus on our more ag specific work. Um, just wanted to go backwards a little bit um, to some of Stacy's slides because many of the photos on here, many of these farmers are folks who have been through both our business planning program or farm transfer planning program with the farm viability um, and conserving either at the same time, either because conservation leads to them realizing they could enroll for business planning or because through their business planning or transfer planning process, they realize that the way to make this viable moving forward is conservation. So um, both the Sats family and the folks who are taking over Woods Market Garden We've worked with um, Wildstone Farm, Boneyard Farm. These are all farms that we've collaboratively worked on both in the conservation department and in the farm viability work. Um, so bumping ahead, um, the Farm and Forest Viability Program, which started its life as uh, the Farm Viability Enhancement Program was the initial name, um, is 20 years old. So about 15 years into the HCB's tenure, we added on this program, um, and the rationale behind that was we'd been conserving land, we knew we needed conservation as a really important tool to keep farmland open and available, but that wasn't solving all of the challenges that farmers were facing. There was still a lot to overcome, and we knew also that there was, if there wasn't an additional set of supports, that many people might not even be able to afford to farm on the land that we had conserved. So. Um, there's a lot of amazing work going on in Vermont to help support farmers in so many ways. And what we added on was a really in-depth, high quality business planning program. Um, so for farmers, and later on about 10 years ago, we added forest businesses. Um, people can enroll, they get matched directly with a really skilled advisor, someone who understands the production side, who understands the financial side, who understands the market side. They can kind of bring all those skills together and support farmers and forest businesses to plan for the future. Um, since we started 20 years ago, we've worked with about 900 businesses. Um, we started off working with between 10 to 30 businesses the first couple of years. At this point in our in-depth program, we typically enroll 50 to 75 new people in any given year, and then we're working with an additional 100 or more either previously engaged and coming back to more for more services um, or getting a little bit more light touch work. So we're touching hundreds of farmers a year through this program um, and dozens of dozens of forest products businesses. Um, and I guess one thing I'll also say about our program model is that uh, we don't have those advisors on staff at BHCB. Uh, we contract with a really great network of other organizations and private consultants who have really built a very unique skill set around this farm business planning. Um, this per, we work with um, the Interrail Center, UVM Extension, the Center for an Agricultural Economy in Hardwick, Land for Good, which is actually a New England-wide organization, and several other smaller organizations. And each of those have a team of one to sometimes five or six people like at UVM who are farm and forest business advisors who come with a production background which is really meaningful. Many of them have run their own farms or other kinds of businesses but bring a deep sort of financial and planning skill set um, and can help businesses make really high quality plans for the future. Um, just this past year uh, in our more in-depth work we worked with uh, 154 businesses um, and combined, that represents uh, about 460 jobs and three, uh, 34.7 million in sales. So it's a pretty significant economic footprint per year. Uh, our general rule of thumb is that in any given year, about a third of the clients we're working with are in some way engaged 
in transfer planning, whether that's just the very beginning stages of saying, we know at some point in the next decade or even two decades this is going to happen and we'll start thinking about the pieces to put in place, or they're actively closing on um, selling a, a farm or business to a new generation. Um, it's all across the map. Um, we do help a lot of people as part of that business planning program um, to access financing, whether it's grants or loans. Um, and really, it, this program is very established. The business advisors in our program have really built deep skills, and, and we see pretty significant um, economic results in addition to improvements in quality of life and ability to take a day off and ability to go to your kid's soccer game. Um, we see that uh, this past year, 71% of clients uh, reported an increase in their sales, um, so their overall gross income, and 60% of those clients also increase their net income. And um, this isn't on the slide, but uh, last year in 2022, I think we had 13 businesses that when they enrolled actually had negative net income, so they were actively losing money. Um, nine of those 13 a year to two years later had uh, gone from negative to positive. Um, so we work with people who are doing well and want to improve, and we work with people who are really struggling and really needing to get um, in the black. That's a good question, Brian. Do you know, if, does Lisa own her property now? I see her up there, or is that a lease? Do you happen to know? Um, I believe it's conserved and she owns it, yeah. Okay, that's a great example. Of, she was yeah. on lease plan uh, for a long time. Yeah. yeah, like a decade. That's right, and yeah. So when she, when this farm came available, it's what we call a farmland access project. She applied and we bought land trust and we worked with her. The development, selling the development rights there played a role in I think, acquiring. So that farm now, for forever, when she sells it, what may or may not happen to the land, just so I can better. It, it need, well, it need, there will never be houses built. On never it. houses she built. She sold okay. the development rights, and I, there Got was it. an option to purchase at ag value. I believe also on that. I'd have to double check that. But no, that's helpful though for me to understand a, a great local example of somebody that was leasing for a long time and Lisa's food is incredible that she grows and it's really expanded over the past 15 years, huge, yeah. She's a really amazing farmer. Amazing, yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we worked with her on business planning around the same time uh, going through conservation and looking for land. Yeah. Um, so we can really get in deep helping people look for a new parcel, yeah. identify whether farms are a good fit for them help them put together the financing, yeah. all that stuff. Um, and it helps the people that did own that as well to, you know, retire. And, yeah, right, that's and, right. With some with dignity. Some money and dignity, yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, great young farmer moving on and yeah. able to, you know, make a living. Yeah. But uh, but she loves to do it. That's right. Yeah, yeah it's a great story. Well, a couple, um, I'll just quickly touch on another aspect of our program, which is making grants. Stacy mentioned our water quality grants program. This has been funded uh, through the capital bill, part of the state's clean water budget. Um, we had a long history of making grants directly to farmers. We tend to have a little more flexibility uh, with what we're able to fund compared to some other state and federal programs. So um, the point of having a small but mighty water quality grants program at BHCB was um, to help people fund projects that might not score well at NRCS or Agency of Ag, but were still meet really meaningful, or to help people uh, be able to access those more complex funding sources because they need the match. So we're working really well together with NRCS and the Agency of Ag and with people doing other innovative projects to um, really improve water quality, whether it's through infrastructure for manure or better grazing practices, lots of different things. Um, and when we've been able to, and when there's been enough funding, we also run something called implementation grants. So for folks who've recently worked in our business advising, uh, they identify a list of projects through that process that are vetted and have been sort of decided on and prioritized with their advisor, and um, they can apply to us for funding to implement some of those projects. So a lot of the examples I'm going to show later on. Um, are people who have been through our planning program and then immediately are able to access a small grant to help roll out a project. Um, Adams Turkey Farm is one of those um, there in Westford. This uh, brings me back to my roots for a little bit. Um, my grandfather ran a 
chicken processing plant in the south for years, and there's not many around here in Vermont, but in this southern is one United of them. States, um, southern Vermont. United States, okay. not southern Vermont. Okay. Um, I forget which state. Some of, some of my colleagues think sometimes southern yeah. Vermont is southern United States. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, depends on where you're sitting. Right, really. right. Um, south of here, quite a yeah. bit. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, in Wexford, they did business planning. Uh, this business had been around for 30 years. They'd never really done a lot of deep planning for the future. Um, we helped them improve their record keeping um, and uh, separate out their personal and business finances. And then they got a grant to help um, add some value added products, including pet food, which is actually a oh, pretty interesting, interesting market. Um, Tyler Riggs, LSF Forest Products up in Fletcher. Um, did business planning with us many years ago and then re-enrolled. He wanted to sort of double to triple his production. Uh, he makes, I think, mostly pine and hemlock boards and also works really closely with timber framers. Um, so we work with all different kinds of forest products businesses from loggers to small mills um, to uh, woodworkers and processors who are processing much of local product. Um, couple other quick stories. Um, Barry Creek Farm up in Westfield. Um, they have a young son who, uh, they're an example of someone who started planning really early to think about, well, we're not ready to retire yet, but we actually want to think about this before we have to retire tomorrow, um, which is how most people usually operate. Um, and so they started to put the pieces in place, whether their son wants to take over, he's in his early 20s now, or whether they want to sell it to someone else that is conserved. Yeah. The, um, the log, uh, Mike was a uh, page boy here. Oh, uh, really? Quite a I few years that. to go. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and heading again down south, but staying in Vermont, um, Evening Song Farm. Um, we've worked with them over, over many different years um, to grow, to get through the pandemic, their business planner. Jen Miller from NOFA, who was in here the other day testifying on organic dairy, really helped them through some tough times um, as they were trying to pivot during the pandemic. They had young children. Um, it was just a really challenging time. Um, so, and as you've seen, this is a lot of different kinds of farms. There hasn't been a dairy yet. We work with a lot of dairies, um, but we work with a lot of other kinds of businesses too, all kinds of scales from quite small to some of the larger businesses. Um, and we do really believe in this program that a diverse set of farms of all scales and types and sizes is really where we need to go as a state. Um, I'm just gonna skim through the rest of these really quickly. This is another example of a farm transfer. It's a conserved farm. We've been working with the younger generation, Jenna, Baird, and Jacob, um, to buy the farm from their parents, um, from Jenna's parents. Um, just highlighting the um, organic dairy issue going on right now, um, as you all heard on Wednesday, there's really quite a crisis in organic dairy and um, We've recently, uh, over the past couple of years, worked with about 38 organic dairies, 26 of whom um, were farmers transitioning from Horizon to another market, including the Lins here um, in Walden. Um, just, we might be losing battery, but I don't know if we can get through the next couple minutes. Um, during uh, 2021 and 20. Yeah, late 2020 to 2021, we launched actually a new, entirely separate wing of our program to, thank you, Polly, um, support folks through COVID. And we actually worked with an additional 600 farm, food, and forest businesses through that really short term, um, super quick needs based kind of emergency response work, um, all different kinds of businesses. Um, and the Rural Economic Development Initiative. Uh, which was created uh, about five years ago um, in this wonderful building, uh, is designed to help small communities and working lands and outdoor recreation enterprises access complex funding sources. Um, we do this all the time on our farm and forest business planning program. Now we do it both with farm and forest businesses and also all different kinds of small communities. Um, the Arlington Common Wellness Center is a community-based um, wellness center with all different kinds of businesses and community spaces. Um, so far we've used about a little over $500,000 in state funding to help 
um, communities access over $10 million in grants. Um, so it's a small wing of our program, but very um, has a really high impact on these small communities, mostly under 5,000. Uh, these are a couple of value-added producer grants, which is a really complicated USDA grant that we've helped farms get uh, Sweet Rowan and Run a Muck Maple. Um, and then just really quickly, I want to highlight um, the major growth that we've seen over last year and this year was directly due to increased state investment in this program. Um, historically, uh, about FY 18 through 21, we were typically working with 100 to 180 businesses a year. Um, and that would cost us, this isn't our overall program budget, for, but specifically for business planning, uh, putting out between 600 and $750,000 in contracts every year. Last year, um, we put out 1.3 million to business advisors to be on the ground with businesses. Um, and that's gonna impact both last year and moving into this year. 318 farm and forest businesses. Um, so really major growth and we really appreciate that support. Um, and same with Ready, uh, over doubling the number of communities supported a year. Um, I'm just gonna interrupt you one second to say uh, two things. One is the picture there um, is exactly, I think, the kind of situation Senator Westman was speaking to, young couple getting on the land getting business support. But the other thing I need to say is that last year in Senator Westman's other committee, um, our base funding was brought up much closer to what some of you know as the property transfer tax level. Uh, this year's proposal would reduce that back to where we were two, three years ago. If that were to happen, uh, our overall funding is fine because of, there's one time money. But if that were to happen, we could not maintain the growth in either the ready program or the farm viability program that we've experienced. So uh, we'd be going back a few years to the prior funding levels. Remind, and just remind me though, we put um, ARPA funds in, it didn't work. We swapped it out and put general fund back. Um, well, no. You and the other body both in, well, un, under the, you the wrote, year before we put. You've given you've given us both ARPA funding and one-time general funds. But last year, what you specifically we, did, I think, think Senator Kitchell talked about this the other day, was under the property transfer tax law, we should get about twenty-seven or twenty-eight yeah. million. We were getting eleven and a half. Last year, you increased that to a little over 20. The governor's budget brings it back to that $11.5 million level and gives us $10 million in one-time funding for housing. And so all I'm saying to you is, if we no, go back. I, I get that, but yeah. we did give ARPA money that was difficult for you to deal with. Um, I, you I have think more flexibility primary, than budget. Primarily, yes, you did absolutely, and, and but I think that was pro primarily at that level on the housing side of things, mm -hmm. um, not on the on what I call the conservation and rural mm -hmm. community development work we're trying to do. So, I, just saying for these programs to maintain the current level of activity, mm -hmm. yep. we can't do it if we go back to that prior level of funding. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and I think this is this is the kind of work that speaks very specifically to your concern that we work more with small farms and work on getting people uh, into ownership and deal with that crisis, as well as working with small rural communities uh, that have a lot of needs and don't have staff uh, to go do the work. So that, that was the point I wanted to make. That um, uh, Senator Kitchell talks quite often when we're talking about ag stuff and VHCD, how well that Ready uh, program has worked uh, over the years, and the the Ready program for you new folks is we set that up and gave Gus a little bit of money, and in the first year, I think it, it kind of what we gave him it tripled the, or something and in uh, 
doing good things, uh, getting well, bringing money into the state that was left sitting on the table of a lot of federal agencies. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, and I noticed on the slide it, it's grown quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know. Yeah, and we would be happy to take it up another notch. Um, I have had a conversation given the governor's proposal of the budget uh, with the agency of the administration about administering a, a sub grant for that help to rural communities work that the yeah. governor wants to do, and they're quite open to that. So uh, maybe it'll get made up some other way, but but not in our base budget. So that that's our our concern is that we don't well. It's move kind to of nice to know what you're going to have from one year to the next. Yeah. You know, this one time stuff that could go away. It, well, we know it, it's all going to ratchet down, and particularly yeah. the housing work. There's no yeah. question. Um, we do have a large pipeline uh, of opportunities in front of us in both housing and conservation, more than you will be able to fund, no matter how generous you choose to be. Uh, but, and this really reflects, I think, often the work of your constituents. So Senator Weston can tell you that it took 10 years to turn Green River Reservoir from an idea into a state park with lots of local folks really working on it. I, I Paul Hannon and I met with uh, Morrisville Water and Light when he was the uh, Forest and Parks Commissioner you know, around 1990, 1989. Uh, and it didn't get uh, we didn't get a deal done for another decade, but but it, if you want to find a beautiful place to spend the summer's day, there's no better place in Vermont. Um, so lots of future opportunity. I know you're at time, and I guess I just want to say since we've turned 35 years and three of us have been around all that time, this slide just tells you what has been done over those 35 years. And What's that So then on the far left? Uh, <laughs> left is gorgeous, Putnam, gorgeous building. Is the Putnam Block in Bennington. And um, when we had the groundbreaking for this, the upper floors had been vacant since the 1970s. This is right at the corner of um, Route 7 and 9, but, but had been vacant yeah, right. for. Did you recognize that? Of building? course, I recognize it. <laughs> of course. I, I hope right you noticed he said that yeah. the most beautiful place to spend the afternoon for for me, I'd rather be on the water than yeah, right. upstairs in the mountain block. But, right. but um, it's made a big difference. Yeah. It's and, making a big difference. And the fellow who's the head, head of the Bennington Bank spoke at the groundbreaking, and he said, "This is a project that makes no economic sense in the world, but it made all the community sense in the world to mm -hmm. not have this hulking structure yeah. in the middle of downtown." But I think it does make economic sense because you know it, it has brought back reasons for people to swing downtown, stop, have a cup of coffee, spend some money. It's, it's bringing more feet on the ground, if you will, that's helping other businesses. Yeah, I am just saying it wouldn't yeah. cash flow by itself. Sure, that, no question. That, I think yeah. that was his point. Yeah, no question. And just, you know, um, yeah. I just want to note on the far right is the Chappet uh, uh -huh. family dairy, which when I met Reg Chappet around in the early 90s, he was buying his first farm and when he built his first barn that was in the middle of a recession in the early 90s and it was actually the largest construction project in Orleans County that year. Oh, yeah. um, and he is now among the large farmers in Vermont, but he used these programs to get to that place to be yeah. a large farmer who employs quite a number of people. Yeah, um, he, and what's really great about that farm yeah. He's, he's got about 5,000 acres that are all contiguous. Wow, so great. he isn't traveling 20 miles and, uh, you know, off the farm and to get the feed. Uh, it's, you know, it was well planned out, but VHCB and the Land Trust, uh, you know, everybody has worked very well. And Reg is very happy with you know, with the help they received. And the very smallest part of our work, or the, you see the, in the middle, 81 historic buildings restored for community use. And there's a picture of the Paulette Library, but Senator Westman is familiar with the old Grange in Morrisville that's now a great center for the arts that kids enjoy working in every day. So if you have a, a community that um, has such a building where they're trying to figure out what to do with it, that's exactly the sort of thing that's that great. we 
provide some funding for and that the ready program assists and then the big picture number i just want to tell you is and you know when the founders of this work first came to senator Starr and senator westman 35 years ago they said we're going to leverage the public's funds and they didn't know how we i mean we had dreams uh, but you've invested about $400 million in this program over 35 years, and your constituents have raised another two, more than $2 billion now from philanthropic funds, from community fundraising, from federal funds, from private investment to make all this work happen across the state. So thank you very much. I know we're at time. We're happy to come back and give you more detail great. on the READY program and the Farm Viability program. And we, when you have a concern, Senator West, Senator Starr just gave me a referral from the town of Leamington this morning, where we think we can be helpful. Um, if I'm not in the building and Polly is, please yeah. let us know. And if neither of us are here, make our phone ring, please. Yeah, well, certainly uh, appreciate your time this morning. And, and well, Gus has been here almost as long as I have. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's been good. Uh, I don't know if we ever had a bad year. We had hard years. We had hard well, debates um, <laughs> at various times. You know, um, when we first began this program, and Senator Westman will know this, there was a fair amount of skepticism in the farm community about whether this was a good idea or not. Um, Representative Wood wasn't the only person who <laughs> no. was unsure that selling development rights would ever be a good thing for, for the ag community. So um, it, we actually yesterday, our board met yesterday, and um, one of the people who helped us in the early years, uh, we had an ag advisory committee, committee is Mike Audette, uh, who yeah. some of you know. Yesterday we approved a deal um, with him and his brother Tom to buy development rights in order for John, a fellow named John Lucas uh, to buy one of their Parsons, uh, and he's a first-generation dairy farmer getting into the business. Yeah. So um, anyway, he was a great help. Well, keep us. up the good work, and we appreciate it. And you know, if we can ever be of assistance, we'll call, and uh, you know, you call us uh, too. And if we have an issue, well, you're around enough so we can. We'll stay in touch. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Well, it's good we got a couple of young institution stuff. Yep. Keep on in. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, well, you've got. Um, Larry should be here momentarily. Just kind of the back. We could take a five minute break. Don't you fight me, Grace? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sure.